Good evening. My name is Linda Sasser, and it's my pleasure to serve as president of the CISD Board of Trustees. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. At this time, Mr. Husbands will lead our invocation, and Mr. Irons will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you'll please stand. Would you pray with me, please? God, we want to thank you tonight for our health, for our successful school year, our productive staff, and our children's many accomplishments. Continue to bless Conroe ISD, our community, our state, and our nation. Continue to help us serve children, our constituents, and our staff, and help us as board members to keep our mission in mind and strive to represent all fairly. Father, again, we ask that you continue to bless our military, keep them safe, and bring peace. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please honor our great country. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor our great state. Honor our Texas flag. flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. <coughs> uh, Madam President, uh, before we start the awards, I uh, might want to point out to people that in honor of our uh, President's uh, Sasser's uh, birthday, there's steak and punch in the back. Uh, please help yourself. Thank you very much. And as, as I told Maria, I'm going to start subtracting a year instead of adding a year. Um, at this time, uh, we have awards and recognitions, and uh, we have a presentation by the CISD Education Foundation, and I believe Mr. Tom Cox. That's going to make that presentation for us. Well, my name is, is Tom Cox, and I am the uh, treasurer of the Conroe ISD Educational Foundation. Our president, Elder Blair, had a last minute commitment tonight, so I am pleased to present the foundation's annual report to the CISD board. As you know, the foundation is dedicated to growing teaching, growing the teaching profession the Conroe ISD, and we have a momentous year. Most of our work comes in the spring with graduating seniors and fundraising. We held our second annual scholarship breakfast in April, hosting a large room full of supporters and raising over $75,000. Our special thanks to PBK Architects and our contact person there, Ian Powell for stepping up again as our presenting sponsor. And our thanks to each of you for attending the Foundation Breakfast and your involvement means a great deal to us. <coughs> then in May, after receiving 18 applications for the Foundation, uh, 18 applications, the Foundation awarded four four four-year four scholarships to seven deserving graduating seniors who desire to become educators. I would like to introduce them and ask that those present tonight to step forward so you can meet the future teachers. If you would, if, as I call your name, come stand here so that they can uh, meet you and greet you. And if I butcher your name, please forgive me in advance. <laughs> <laughs> From Caney Creek High School, Ashley Hill. Alan James Schwinn, who also received the Coach Matt Sheldon Memorial Scholarship. <laughs> From Conroe High School, Ashley Jennings. <laughs> From Oak Ridge High School, Sindel Jeanette Busby. <laughs> K 
Catherine Leanne Cleveland. Jesse Nicole Schaefer. From the Woodlands College Park High School, Joshua Richard Holland. These are the scholarship recipients if you want to turn around and beat the board. <laughs> Congratulations. 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 Makes you want to go back to school and be taught again. <laughs> <laughs> and this year, for the first time, we are pleased to announce the foundation gave scholarships to existing Conroe ISD teachers to help further their education and value to Conroe ISD. We received 29 applications and awarded eight scholarships. I would like to introduce those teachers and ask those present tonight to step forward. Christopher Allen from Woodlands High School. Mary Ellen Bryant from Barbara Bush Elementary. Jerry Butler from Glenlock Elementary. Orisha Hatch from the Dis Discipline Alternative Educational Program. William Kelly from the Caney Creek High School. Catherine Lancaster from the Woodlands College Park High School. <laughs> Mark. Pionka from the Woodlands High School. Alejandra Tapea Calcasieu from Conroe High School. And Kimberly Bezervelt from the Mitchell Collins. <laughs> Turn around and greet the board. Congratulations. Good luck next year and with your studies. Good luck to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cox, and thanks to the Foundation. We are very appreciative of your recognition of our present teachers and our future teachers. We appreciate your efforts very much. Uh, at this time, we have some special district recognitions. Um, throughout the year, the board has chosen to uh, recognize individuals who go above and beyond what they're asked to do and who are just great ambassadors for our school district, and uh, we'd like to present those awards at this time. Dr. Mel Brown has some presentations for some members of our custodial department. <laughs> Before I uh, read the names, let me read the uh, the uh, honor itself. The Conroe ISD Board of Trustees and the Superintendent recognize, in the name of the recipient, Custodial Department for Achieving Excellence. The first one I'd like to recognize is Elizabeth Moreno. And Dr. Brown, Mr. Mike Patrick, who's head of our custodial department. Now, Mike, you want to come and introduce? In fact, it might be better if you did these names than me. <laughs> Dr. Stockton, President Sasser, and members of the board, I'm so pleased tonight to uh, 
present the following people to you. Um, it, these are very special people, and I had some notes written, and I, I think the notes probably don't do justice, so I'm just going to speak from my heart. But these people are the same people who um, the very basic tenets that we all know are so critical to make any uh, to achieve any goal. They have it. The, the attendance, the excellent attendance, the punctuality that they have, the excellent punctuality, their positive winning attitude, and they do such a good job, their performance. Uh, they just, uh, uh, i tell you what, I'm just so proud of them. And as I... <laughs> from the Caney Creek... Um, a feeder zone, of course, we have Elizabeth Marino, who's been with us seven years, and Salvador Vesosa. Salvador? Salvador has been with us. Salvador always has a smile. He's been with us ten years. From Conroe High feeder zone, Ursula Ramirez, who's been with us seven years. Back. And James Deary, solid as a rock. We're so glad to have James with us. The Woodlands uh, High School feeder zone. Well, let's see, the Woodlands College Park feeder zone. Pardon me. Rennie Tan, 17 years with our department. And Linda Truong, who's been such a pleasure for 23 years with our department. The Woodlands High feeder zone, Sabina Tuerta. Sabina has just done an excellent job. Such a good influence on all of our younger custodians or people who are new to our department. Lily Edmonds, you'll see her face at the last. She does a marvelous job. From the Oak Ridge High feeder zone, Larry McCain. And Larry has, has been a very, very special person for us. And from that same feeder zone, Oak Ridge, Deli Garcia. Thank you, Deli. Great job. Thank you all so much, and, and thank you for this time, and thank you for being here to be recognized because it means so much to all of us. While they're being congratulated by the board members, let me say that uh, Thank you so much. that the impression of this, uh, that the district receives from the appearance of our buildings shapes what they think before they ever enter the building. Uh, when I used to run an organization, and I stressed to them, you know, what people think is for, uh, first shape of the way we look. So uh, thank you all very much. At this time, we would also like to um, honor several employees from our maintenance department. And Mr. Um, Charlie Bollinger will introduce these outstanding employees, <laughs> and Ms. C.J. Haynes will make the presentations for the board. Thank you, Dr. Stockton, Ms. Sasser, members of the board. We're here tonight to recognize four employees from the maintenance department. We have a smaller cadre of folks, so we only have 80, so we pick four. We don't have a feeder system, so we're, we're everywhere. <laughs> uh, we have one feeder system, Conroe ISD. Uh, Shelly Curry, step up here. She's our admin. She her duties are all kinds of different types of duties. Uh, but she performs them every day and doesn't complain and keeps everybody in line over at the maintenance department. And uh, uh, she's a great employee. So that's that's the first one. <laughs> Judy, Reeves. Judy Reeves is our traffic cop. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's been here for only two years, but she fades a lot of the, the heat when people are upset when the air conditioning doesn't work. And she <laughs> smooths them over, and we get out there and get it fixed for them. And... Uh, 
Uh, she's really great to deal with, and she's the the number two uh, best person in the world besides Shelly. I gotta say that, right? <laughs> no, they're both they're all great. James Piazzanola. <laughs> <laughs> He's been with the district only three years, but he's a, long, a very, very strong leader in the HVAC department. His work ethic and cooperative nature is an integral part of that, that HVAC department. We're really proud to have him here. One other person who didn't make it is Billy Lucashay. He's the quiet electrician you never see because he works the evenings from 3 to 8 to 11.30. He's this real quiet guy that changes all the light bulbs and all the ballasts and stuff like that. And then he works in the, doing portals in the summer, but he couldn't make it not because of his grandchildren. But these are the four we picked for this year. And all the rest of the maintenance people, we have several of you will stand up. Uh, They're all great folks, and I love working with them, and we work really hard for y'all. But these are the people who make things happen in the CISD Maintenance Department. On behalf of the board, and I'm sure all the staff and the teachers, we truly appreciate these folks. and glad they could come tonight to be recognized. Congratulations. Hey, is he your hero? We appreciate all of these recipients so much and everybody that works in all of these departments because obviously without them we could not run our district. So thank you so much to all of you for, for being here. At this point in our um, agenda, we have citizen participation. Um, Madam Secretary, is anyone signed up to speak? <laughs> the next 30 minutes on the agenda this evening have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please keep in mind that this portion of the meeting is not the appropriate means for bringing complaints for which resolution is sought. Complaints must be addressed by following the appropriate policies and administrative procedures before they can be submitted to the Board of Trustees as an agenda item. Those who have registered to address the Board will be limited to no more than five minutes for their presentation. Delegates of more than five persons must appoint one representative to present their views to the Board. Also keep in mind that the Board cannot deliberate or make a decision regarding any subject that is not posted on the agenda, but it can furnish specific factual information or cite existing policy in response to inquiries. Madam Secretary. Labana Berry. Good evening, Dr. Stockton and Mrs. Sasser and trustees. It is my great honor and privilege as the local president of the Association of Texas Professional Educators to present Dr. Kaufman, <laughs> scholarship award winner for this year, Miss Charlotte Meadows. Charlotte. <laughs> Charlotte will be a second generation educator. Her mother is Brenda Meadows. Y'all know Brenda. And Charlotte is going to start a, what, third career as a librarian. Oh, I know. Hoffman? That's cool. I'll face the board, and we'll make this presentation to them. <laughs> that preamble sounds a lot more ominous when you're sitting out there. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Got me all scared here. <laughs> it's such my pleasure and my honor to be here tonight with Charlotte and um presenting to the board somebody that is really important to education and hopefully CISD. As we are here tonight watching the young people getting presented, uh, their, their scholarships presented, I think, you know, there's the youth. They are uh, going to go to college and with any, with hard luck and all those things, they will be successful. They will be teachers and they will come back to us and 
and honor the next generation of children. This lady has already been there, done that. She has a degree in history. She has a master's degree also in history. And she's chosen education to go back, start again, and prove her worth and come out as a librarian. And that, to me, means a lot. She is also, interestingly enough, she is a Navy veteran. She ser served in Desert Storm. So our kids are getting some, someone special here with Charlotte because they're getting somebody that's been around a little bit and was educated in one field and said, I'm ready to go back into education. And Anne, you're shaking your head. So many of the, the kids that, uh, that your children and mine that they went to high school with chose a degree in something or other, and they're filtering back to us in education. The board's been so kind, and Don has been kind to hire a lot of those people, and, and uh, they've done a pretty darn good job for us. Uh, it especially gives me the honor to be here for this presentation that's, that's in my name. Lavon, I really appreciate that so much. And um, the award this year is for $850, so we hope that that helps a little. And um, I'm going to make that award to you right now. Thank you so much for doing what you've done, your dedication back to education, and hopefully you'll come back to CISD and be one of ours. Thank you so much. I just wanted to thank Dr. Kaufman for this award for helping me further my education to get my master's in library science in order to get a job in Connor ISD as a librarian. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary, is there anyone else signed up to speak? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on to um, item three on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. I've been asked by a couple board members uh, because they have questions to pull off item B and vote on it separate. So if I could have a motion to so accept uh, the consent agenda with the exception of item B. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any comments or questions? <coughs> All in favor, show by raising your hand. <coughs> All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, and we'll look at uh, item D, which is the proposed uh, lawn and garden, <coughs> lawn and ground maintenance. And Bobby Burns is bringing that to us. And Mr. Burns, if you would um, entertain some, I believe we have some questions. Okay. <coughs> Would you like to start, or would you like the questions first? Let's go ahead and get the questions. Okay. <laughs> well, why don't you, why well, don't you five, talk about the item? Okay, had five bettors. So <clears throat> uh, the low better was a 1505. Uh, we have checked their references. Uh, we checked their credentials. And uh, so we were making a recommendation to try. This was going to be a pilot program for six campuses only. See how it worked out. Uh, we've not we've not tried this before. But um, we have seven new campuses coming on board. So we're going to use the the crews that normally work on these six schools to work on the, the seven coming on board this summer. We're just trying to get a little bit extra help. I think that if, uh, by hiring this uh, group or if you approve, then we could possibly kind of cut down on our overtime. It may, may, there may be a savings to the district overall. Okay. Um. Just, just for clarification, the 1505 is per time they visit each six schools? That is correct. Okay. Uh, they would be cut, they were making 35 visits per year. Okay, so they visit 35 times. Yes, sir. So they, there, there's nowhere in there. Basically, what do you think our savings is 
um, either per cutting or annually or however you want to give it to me. I, I understand you probably have an idea of what it costs you to do those six campuses now in time and labor and, and overhead and whatever. Yes, sir. Equipment. So you're not going to have to buy more equipment or you're not going to have to pay overtime to have them ride the equipment more or drive it or whatever they do. Yes, sir. So how much uh, are we looking at? There could be as much as a little over $2,000 per cutting. $2,000 times 35 is $70,000 a year am I in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. That's what and, about what ours and of course, does. this being a pilot program and a program where we're not having to terminate anybody who currently does it, but not having to hire anybody new that does the additional campuses That's that we have correct. coming online. And we don't at this time know what the quality would be. So we will find out. That is correct. So I say it is a pilot program for one year to see how it goes. can be terminated at any time by either party. <laughs> Okay, so next year we could buy more mowers, pay more overtime, hire more people, and mow our own again. That is correct. Okay. Then the next question I have is, do you have the information on these people's uh, liability and workers' comp insurance? Yes, we do. Okay. And do they match with uh, our insurance company's requirements for lines, limits, and so on and so forth? They, they do. Okay. And the last thing is, and this is by way of, contractors and subcontractors, but I understand, and I don't know if it's a law, they're thinking about it, they want to do it, or they're not going to do it, so I honestly don't know. But the concern here is background check, fingerprinting, uh, whatever you want to call that general vicinity of, of ideas and thoughts about people who come on our campuses and are anywhere near our schools or children. What we have in the contract, they will have a, uh, which we already have on file, is a felony conviction for the owner. Now, what's I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. We do have a felony conviction uh, clarification in the in the contract or the proposal for the, the owners of the company. As each person comes on to the schools, they will be actually use the rafter white. Okay. And does that do a background check in and of itself? Yes. Like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a minimal, yes. It would be a for uh, child support, child molesters, that type of thing. I'm not sure how far back it does go, but I know it does in those few things. Okay. Well, our, I actually, our parents can come in and one-time visit using the Raptor system, but if you're a regular volunteer at a school, you're having to do much more these days. Right. Correct? The, the difference here is they don't have direct contact with the students. <laughs> okay. All right. And the last thing is is a rather touchy subject, <laughs> and and frankly, I I don't mean anything by it, but my concern is some groundskeepers that I actually do business with hire people that aren't necessarily in the country legal, and I'm not sure where the district should stand with that issue about hiring subcontractors, if you will. I, I don't know. Do you, can you answer me on that with regard to other subcontractors we may hire? Uh, no, sir. We, there again, we check just the owners for criminal convictions. We, do not, um, we don't have a contract with a subcontractor on a, on a construction job. Our contract is with the architects and the general contractor only. Okay. We do require that, they're, that the owners of those companies Whenever, when the contract is signed, to be cleared. But as far as the employees that they hire on a daily basis, they're they're not screened. Okay, so so we don't have any mechanism by which to verify whether our general contractors hire all legal worker documented workers or not. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burns, you said that you have a contract on on file already. We have a contract. We have a proposal. A proposal? <clears throat> okay. We can't sign. You have to sign the contract. Okay. Um, would it be possible for us to get a copy of that? Sure. The proposal shows the uh, the felony conviction uh, clar clar clarification, and it shows their references, the names, the contact people, which we've already contacted. Mr. Burns, are there other school districts have you had discussions with them that, that outsourced this? Some have. Some have been very successful. Some have not. 
Some do it on a limited basis. I like during peak seasons, uh, during summer, uh, just before. Like most open houses are in August and September when school first starts, they'll hire a, a couple of groups to help reinforce their groups so then, then they cut them loose. Uh, if we approve the proposal, then the contract comes back to us later time. The contract does not come back. Mr. Question. Burns, I congratulate you on trying to figure out ways to save this district money, first of all. I am kind of at the point where I'm not, I'm not sure whether the contract, frankly, whether the contract's going to do anything for me or not. Uh, but They're gonna I, I, I'm leery. Let me put it that way. I'm not, le you know, not whether the grass is cut right or not. I mean, we can fix that. Fire them and hire somebody else. But um, I'm just, I'm just concerned. I got to say that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm not sure I can put my finger on. Well, there again, it's a pilot program. This is our first time at it. So we're kind of stepping into some new ground ourselves. So these people use their own equipment? Yes. They provide their own transportation, their own fuel, and their own liability insurance. Okay. And they do so they do have a uh, workers' comp affidavit. That's all the questions I have. Okay. Uh, several. Uh, this contract is similar to what we use for other entities that we outsource. Is that fair, very similar um, to a multi-vendor award. It's very similar that we use the three-year, you know, those are three-year awards yeah. and they're renewed annually. On that, uh, and it's a pilot program that under your leadership, if it doesn't work to satisfaction or uh, during the summer, then we could terminate the next That's correct. that month. Okay. Well, let me, uh, and... This would the way we're doing this would be no different than the way we do construction contracts, right? In terms of checking employees. That's correct. Right, kind of high school. This would this would relate to a general contractor. That's, that's mm -hmm. the only one we actually have contracts with. Madam President, I move the approval. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to approve. Um, the proposal pertaining to the lawn and grounds maintenance. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Thank you, Mr. Burns. Uh, we'll move on to item agenda item four, curriculum and instruction. Dr. Simpson. So 4A is the preliminary elementary and secondary uh, three through 11 tax results. For 2008, Dr. Gibson and Mrs. Drummond, please. Good evening, Mrs. Sasser, board members, and Dr. Scott Stockton. Uh, it is my honor once again to present to you our preliminary tax scores for 2008. I know you've had an opportunity to review these scores, and as you know, uh, these are still preliminary. They are projected scores. Uh, they have not gone through their final refinement process. Uh, so uh, this is just a ballpark of where we stand. As you will see, there is a theme throughout these scores. Uh, we have our tax third and fourth grade. This is our students that took the tax assessment in English. This is the majority of our students. And as you can see, they, we have outperformed the state uh, with a 96%. Uh, our mathematics scores, once again, we've outperformed the state at a 92%. Uh, you can see our trends are very strong. Uh, and in our fourth grade reading, we have outperformed the state as well in mathematics and in writing. In our tax third and fourth grade Spanish, as you know, this is an area that we have been working on. Uh, these scores represent somewhere between 200 and 250 students, and that's the entire district. Uh, you can see once again that our trends are holding strong for CISD, as well as we have outperformed the state in reading, third grade, in mathematics, very strong performance all the way around. Uh, compared last year this time as well to the state performance. 
Uh, once again, reminding you that these are not our final scores, that they will go through a refinement process, and uh, we will see um, some changes in these scores. Uh, grade four, reading. Uh, once again, we have outperformed the state mathematics, 82% uh, in writing, 89% um, in our fourth grade writing. In our fifth and sixth grade students who took the assessment in English, uh, once again, we have outperformed the state with a 94% in reading, a 94% in math, and an 89 in science. Uh, you know, this area of science we've worked very hard on. And uh, once again, it's a very strong performance, and uh, we will further continue to, to uh, strengthen this program. In grade six, our reading scores, once again, 96%. In, and in mathematics, a 90% strongly outperforming the state, and our Spanish scores. Uh, once again, the numbers really get small in terms of the students that have taken the tax assessment in Spanish, and they range anywhere from 40 to 78 uh, students, and that's district-wide. This is something, once again, we've been working on, 80% um, in reading, 62% in math, 23 in science, that represents 48 students in the district, and uh, in, re in reading grade six, a 74%, mathematics, 25%. And these are our fifth and sixth grade uh, scores. Could, uh, could we see that, not necessarily at a board meeting, could, could we get copies of that data by campus? Absolutely. Awesome job. Yeah. Matter of fact, good evening, Mrs. Sasser, Dr. Stockton, members of the board. It's my privilege to share our secondary scores with you this evening. And we also are continuing very good trends. Uh, we pattern the state. We continue to outperform the state in all of our areas in seventh grade in uh, reading. 89%, math 84%, and writing 92%. In eighth grade, we're very proud of our eighth graders and our uh, teachers. You know, this is the first year for SSI. Our students needed to pass in order to go to the ninth grade, and we think that that was a significant uh, impact <laughs> on our kiddos in the eighth grade, but we also, we had Tax Academy last summer for these eighth graders in the seventh grade. We're going to do a little study and see what that impact may have had on those students in the eighth grade, plus they've had all of their interventions on their campuses. But we're very, very proud of our scores in eighth grade, reading 97 percent, math 90 percent, Science, 80%. This is the first year that science counts for us in eighth grade. And social studies, 95%. And you can see that we still continue to outperform the state. We're very proud of those eighth graders. In ninth grade, we continue to outperform the state. And we have the same trends in the state. The state took a dip, and so did we in reading. And the same in math. Um, we're all constantly working with ninth grade to see what we need to do to, to assist and help. Um, it's a challenge, and we're all up for it. So, but we're still very the, pleased. Was there a change in the test, or? You know, we don't know. We have we don't get to see the test again this year. So, our anticipation is possibly, you know, just strange. It. I mean, not on. I mean, us in the state too would take right. the same day. And keeping in mind that this is preliminary, when we get everything refined, we anticipate our scores are going to go up. Now the states could too. But it will be really interesting to see what happens. And that's across the board with all of our, our, all of our uh, grade levels. In 10th grade, we outperformed the state. In reading, we have a 92%. In math, 75%. Science, 75%. And social studies, 94%. Uh, in most cases where the state had a dip, so did we. And I'm sure we'll all be studying that and trying to assess. And looking forward to seeing what happens when we get our final data tables in July. 
In 11th grade, reading 94%, math 87%, science 87%, social studies 98%. Again, our 11th graders know that this test counts for graduation. So we see an improvement from 10th to 11th grade every year. Our campuses are working very, very hard. Uh, we're all very proud of them, uh, the students as well as the teachers and, and the principals and their staff. So I appreciate you letting me share. Yeah, I've asked well the done. same information. By yeah. campus? Yeah. Do you want that before we get the refined or what, do you want to wait? What we've done in the past, this, this is a little different information you've seen this time in previous years because there's more cleanup that has to be done. Uh, due to some of the new uh, regulations, what we've done in the past, wait till we clean it up, and then we okay. Get it. Yeah, yes. I'll, that'd be we'll good. make sure you get it then. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes. I, I'm, I'm I apologize for this question because it may be for my <laughs> ignorance, but how different is the, for example, the science or the math, from tenth grade to eleventh grade test? Is it is it the same test? No. It is not. No. No, there, there will be a higher level of critical thinking questions at the 11th grade level than there are at the 10th grade. Because, you know, I mean, at that level, some kids have taken calculus and some have only right. taken pre-calculus. Right. So I didn't know if the test changed or, or if, albeit a different test, if it was the same, testing the same information. Right. It is more advanced. You know, I hate to put Cheryl Heim on the spot, but she's here, and I bet she knows a whole lot more about this than I do. She's our science coordinator for the district. Cheryl, would you mind addressing that? Because I've heard your answer before, but it's better coming from you. The different, there is a difference between the 10th and 11th grade test. The 10th grade test has a higher number or percentage of biology questions on it and fewer chemistry and physics questions. But because the kids move up between 10th and 11th grade and they're more into the chemistry and physics, the 11th grade test has fewer biology uh, than the 10th grade test and more chemistry and physics questions. Other than... That's, those are really the differences between the two tests. And those, of course, are areas that are, the kids really struggle with, the chemistry and the physics piece. You know, I might tell you, um, Cheryl's done an outstanding job in helping our campuses, uh, giving support. Science has really been a focus. We have a science tax academy uh, that we ran last summer for our juniors and seniors who needed to retest. We're doing the same thing again this summer, but we're running it along uh, with summer school. So it's a longer period of time. The students will go in and finish the Friday before they test the following week in July. Uh, we've also made a deal with some of our students if they go to Tax Science Academy and they, they're successful on their tax test, if they're short a half credit in science, we're going to award them the half credit of science because we know they're getting the skill development through this tax academy. So then that helps them get ready for graduation and meeting their requirements. So we're real excited. Cheryl told me we had 60 kids today and we anticipate a few more. So outstanding. We're holding that at Pete. So in the mornings, uh, the teachers are doing an outstanding job. So if you're, if you don't have anything to do, you can go by Pete in the mornings and <laughs> check it out. Thank one, you, Cheryl. Thank you. One, you? one last question, and yes, that sir. is that is simply, um, this is one taking of the 11th grade, yes. correct? Yes. It now, does not include any retest. So this is, the, as juniors, they have one shot at it, but then they have two or three more. They have four more chances before they graduate. That's 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 all I need to yeah. know. When they are, yeah. that, that's not important. Yeah. They do. You know, you asked that question about alignment of, of coursework and the test, and that's one of the reasons we're generally excited about end of course exams, right. because the alignment is, is, it's aligned. So we're excited about that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibson, and this comment. Great report. Okay. Um, Um, item 4B. 4B is uh, 2009 Solid Waste Grant. Dr. Hines is here to present that. Good evening, Ms. Sasser, 
Members of the board, Dr. Stockton, I have to be honest, I never envisioned the evening that I would be here talking trash to the board. <laughs> here we are. I do want to acknowledge uh, Cheryl Heim is out here tonight, and, and Cheryl has done the yeoman's work on this grant, so I want to say thank you for her uh, efforts in the, on that part. Tonight we're here to ask for your approval to apply for the Houston Galveston Area Council Solid Waste Grant. Um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but every two weeks Texans dump enough trash to fill the Astrodome. That's 19.2 million tons of Texas municipal solid waste that would fill two lanes of IH-10 from Beaumont to El Paso, 10 feet high. And uh, the reality is it is our goal to reduce the amount of solid waste that is accumulated at our school schools, which end up being taken to landfills throughout the year. And we want to do this by diverting as much of the recyclable materials uh, to uh, away from our normal waste pickup into recycling efforts. Uh, in addition, many of our students and staff are accustomed to recycling. They do this at home. We do have recycling efforts on all of our campuses with paper and cardboard currently. We have a system. It's a nonprofit group that picks up the dumpsters. They don't come very often, but they do come, and uh, every once in a while we have to chase paper blowing through the parking lots because they don't come, but, uh, but we do have a process for the paper and the cardboard, which is a little bit more profitable than the plastic recycling. Um, you might be wondering what keeps us from recycling on a large scale. The short of it is is that uh, there's, there are many reasons. One of them is our current waste disposal provider does not provide this service. They do not provide recycling. There is a cost associated with recycling. Um, the biggest part is you have to store it, we have to collect it, we have to have it picked up, we have to take it into a recycle center. Um, we have had many recycling efforts cease to exist because at the end of the day, we had all this stuff and we had no way to get it moved. Uh, and so that's that's one of the problems that comes up. And we know that after a while, having a bunch of um, sticky cans or bottles laying around can attract uh, rodents or bugs and some other problems. So uh, it, it really has been an issue. Uh, so the biggest obstacles are storage and movement of the materials. We currently have uh, two pilots that are underway at the Woodlands High School and the Woodlands College Park. And we, we're doing this through some outside volunteer groups as well as a recycler that's located um, in, the, in the South County area that is uh, participating. So we have something going on currently. What are we requesting? We are requesting uh, in the grant $105,726. Uh, we want to uh, recycle as much paper, plastic, and metal as possible. We would like to target 800 tons of diverted trash for recycling. Uh, just looking at it, um, you know, that we know that we are uh, currently, we estimate that we pick up um, in a 40 week period uh, 156,400 um, yards of trash, so, or at least the capacity to move that much in terms of dumpsters. Uh, the grant supports the areas of pickup of materials, education of students, staff, consultant support, uh, recycle containers for the classrooms and facilities to support the effort. The largest portion of the grant funds, if awarded, would pay waste management uh, for pickup of the recyclable products. This is estimated at $66,000 roughly. Uh, we also have in the grant uh, almost $8,000 for a part-time consultant to help us with perhaps ways that we can get better at it, ways we can look at uh, trying to reduce the amount of trash that we're throwing away, <laughs> the amount of dumpster pickups, um, educational materials, recycle bins for classrooms, teacher workrooms, cafeterias, and stadiums, which will be about $30,000, $31,000 in cost for those recycled containers. What will our cost be? I know, Dr. Brown, you were going to ask that, what, what our costs were going to be. And uh, as part of the grant application, we're agreeing to in-kind cost of $104,815. This would uh, come from various sources. We would provide training at each campus, which is valued at uh, $2,550. Instructional uh, supplies, which basically paper valued at $300. 
uh, stipends to have some uh, coordinators for recycling on, uh, on our larger campuses at $125, valued at $1,500. We wanted to uh, work with some of our high school students, maybe environmental science or some other or our clubs to actually come out and help promote recycling efforts and have some education programs at the elementary schools. So we, est we estimate that to be at $4,400. Uh, we would be providing the plastic bags and the latex gloves uh, valued at approximately $4,000. And then, of course, the largest contribution would be just the time and effort involved in trying to assist with recycling efforts from our custodial department. And we hope to be able to, to supplement that with student clubs and, and certainly make it a, a school-wide effort, but we know that there will be some cost in terms of associated with our own folks in terms of their labor. You know, what are we going to do when the grant expires? Um, and we don't know. <laughs> we, we do know that um, we're not sure how it's going to play out, but our hope is that we will, during the course of the year, be able to find ways to sustain our future efforts by perhaps realizing some savings uh, in our current trash costs by being able to reduce the total number of dumpsters and or the frequency with which they are serviced. Uh, we, we estimated that if we could, for example, reduce um, one eight-yard container from campuses that have three or four, that we would save $27,216 in a year. So if we could change out one of their dumpsters with a recycled container. If we could drop um, 29 campuses down, uh, from the, if we went down to those that had two or more dumpsters, we could realize a savings of up to $87,000, which perhaps could be diverted towards reducing the amount of trash or thrown away. Again, these are just preliminary numbers. We really don't know until we actually get in there and, and try it. But our goal would be to uh, shift the costs, not to incur new costs uh, for our current uh, solid waste disposal, uh, and so and at the same time reduce the amount of trash that's actually being taken away to landfills. Okay. Is there any obligation to pay back money if we don't pick it up after the end of the grant period? No, sir. Dr. Hines, uh, on your list but, of I, items that I'm. I'm sorry, I wanted to finish that answer. No, there is not. However, uh, they're weighing that in part of their decision-making process as, as far as, you know, Continuation. It, you know that's part of their matrix for deciding whether we'll win, get the grant or not. Is So we are making a, a commitment to pick it up? No, sir. But, but, but our lack of making that commitment we may hurt our efforts to get the grant. I just want to make that clear. Well, I just... I, having dealt with grants, I've, not, I've taken grants where if we didn't pick it up, I mean, we started earmarking because we knew that we didn't pick it up. We were going to be paying for something we'd already, paying back for something we'd already done. Sure. So. I'm sorry, Mr. Husbands. On on your list of items uh, that constitute our matching dollars, uh, there's 60-odd thousand dollars in there for the waste management. Is that in addition to our other dumpsters? Or is that in replacement of some or all of our dumpsters? Right now, it's in, that's a good question. Right now, it's in addition to our current service contracts. But what you're saying is if we didn't get the grant the second year and we were able to replace those dumpsters, that 68 that we don't get, or, or, or let me put it this way, if it costs so much to do it, we might be 68 or more to the good because we had established the program using the grant dollars. That is our hope. Our, our, I think our, at the end of the day, our hope is that we can take the regular dumpsters and replace them with recycle dumpsters and not pay for the, the cost of picking up from the waste, our current waste provider, and shift that cost to paying someone to come get it to recycle it. Madam President, I move the approval. I have two comments, Linda, if I okay. may. Uh, two, uh, one, uh, you went through and showed what the immediate uh, uh, cost would be if, if we did incur it for the second year. But I think what we need to look at is a much longer term that the intrinsic value of teaching our uh, system and being a, uh, a business uh, that uh, does uh, incorporate recycling is, uh, much, is priceless. I, I do want to respond that, that I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Snyder, because one of the things that we keep talking about is our kids will come to us and yeah. say, where do I put my plastic yeah. bottles? Yeah. Where do I put my paper? And like I said, we do do paper 
the products currently, but we haven't been doing plastic or aluminum because of the, at the end of the day, we couldn't get it away. Uh, but you're right, and I think I mean, that it is important for us to, to model that. And on that, too, uh, uh, my place of employment, we contract with the Houston Galveston Area Council uh, for uh, a large amount of sum, so I will need to abstain. Right I'll now, we have, a, we have a motion on the floor second. and a second. Any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I have a question. It's related indirectly, I guess. Uh, the, the dumpsters, or pardon me, the recycling bins that we have outside, I know Armstrong has uh, a number of Eight them rounds. outside. Do we get uh, funds from recycling from someone for those? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a very small amount, but it is a, uh, um, Cheryl, remind me what the name of them, that company? Abitivi. And they, it's a, they're a nonprofit group, and so they pick it up. And they resell their that what they pick up, and they give us a commission per. And the, depending on the number of tons that they collect from that site, is the amount per ton that they pay does us. Does that go back to that school, or yes, does sir. that come into okay? Goes back to each campus. And this, you know, this could have an impact because we would be uh, somewhat competing with that effort. But again, we're just trying to reduce the amount of trash we're throwing away too. And, and those still, those containers will still be available out where they are for the public to use, and we and we get a lot of public use of those. Uh, it had me concerned. I haul all of mine to one of the schools, all my newspapers, and I was thinking I may have been doing that all these years for nothing if the school wasn't getting anything out of it. So. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, we have a motion to approve the grant application to the 2009 solid waste. A uh, grant by HDAC. Um, all in favor, if you'd raise your hand. Opposed? Motion carries. Who knew trash caught could be so expensive? <laughs> okay, we'll move on to um, item 5A, the naming of the new building at Conroe High School. Dr. Stewart, please. Good evening, Dr. Stockton. President Sasser, members of the board. This evening I'm delighted to bring to you this item uh, for your information this evening. Uh, this is part of our board policy CW Local uh, involving the naming of a facility. And it has been recommended uh, to us that we share with you the recommendation from the um, site-based committee at Conroe High School. They would like us to consider the naming of the new music building that is being built at that campus uh, in honor of Ralph Rowe. Ralph Rowe was the Tiger Band director for 20 years, from 1957 through 1977. And during that tenure, um, the Tiger Band went to UIL contests for 14 years, and for 10 of those 14, uh, they won the Sweepstakes Award, which is the highest award uh, received for a band from UIL experiences. So this committee has recommended the naming, and at this time, as our procedures and policies <laughs> uh, dictate, we would present it to you just for information. Um, it will be presented to the District Level Planning and Decision Making Committee in their July meeting, and then we'll return to you with a recommendation uh, from them at your next board meeting. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Very welcome. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Item 5B, the design developed for the Williams College Park High School. Uh, Mr. Burns, please. Uh, Ms. Astor, Dr. Stock, members of the board. Uh, tonight we have several agenda items concerning the design development of various campuses. And uh, the first four are designs that are being worked on by PBK Architects. I'm going to ask Mr. Ian Powell, PBK Architects, to come up and present the next four items. Yes, sir. And Mr. Steve Santos, uh, also PBK Architects, is in the audience. Thank you, Ms. Burns. Uh, good evening, Madam Board President, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. It's our pleasure to be here tonight and to present to you, as Mr. Burns indicated, the four of the first projects that are rolling out as part of the 2008 bond referendum. The very first one uh, is, I believe, agendized for you, is the additions and renovations to Woodlands College Park High School. And the basis of the work on this campus relates to, and I'll characterize them as relatively simply, two primary components, one being the addition of an academic 
uh, group of spaces and the other being the addition of athletic spaces on the campus. In this aerial, what you see are the two shaded areas. The, uh, the, the segment in the viewer center is the athletic, excuse me, is the academic component of the additions and to the viewer's right-hand side of the aerial is the athletic component. Um, on this site, this is a constrained site, and, and actually, um, given the needs of the campus, it's almost perfect in terms of the appropriateness of the locations for both of these. The athletic is organized close to the existing PE and athletic areas, and the academic areas are located central and, and proximate to uh, most of the other academic areas. This is a, a drawing of that same um, uh, site plan. This is the first floor description of each of those. And the, the academic component consists of, for the most part, 15 general purpose instructional spaces, uh, a group of science labs, um, a drama class, life skills area, foreign language labs, computer labs, all the components that were reviewed by campus staff and administrative staff um, and then endorsed during the planning for the bond. On the right-hand side of the image, on the first floor is the athletic component, which uh, the, the sort of the key pieces of that include a third gymnasium, uh, a dance and drill team room, a wrestling room, additional um, locker and dressing spaces for athletics, uh, two health classrooms, and uh, area for coaches as well. The second floor component of the academic area is where the science labs are located. It's a relatively compact plan. It will afford us the opportunity to make connections directly to the building so that a student can access either the academic wing or the athletic wing directly from the inside without going outside the school. And it will still retain the courtyard on the back side of the school, which we think is an appropriate feature. This is an aerial view uh, showing the campus from the southeast corner. And the shaded roof areas represent these segments that correspond to the academic area as well as the athletic additions. This is an artist's depiction of the back of the school showing the extension of the academic wing back from the existing commons area uh, southwards towards the south property line. And at least from our perspective, we thought it was awfully important to make sure that the character of the additions uh, complemented and worked well with the existing building. Um, so it's, it appears to have a very academically proud sort of image to the facility. And our goal, our hope, would be that we present something to you that, that would be something that in later years would not look like it had been added on to the facility. The de project details reflect a project schedule that has us completing our documentation in July, issuing documents to the contractors whom you've identified to do that work, receiving the subproposals in the fall, and then uh, taking action on that in the fall, and then being substantially complete with these additions on this campus by July 2010. These are also details related to the project of the contractor that you have identified and, and assigned to the work, the construction budget taken straight from the 2008 bond referendum, scheduled completion date, and our progress to date at this time. I would be certainly very happy to answer any questions about that project. One, I know that the space uh, really dictates where the additions were. Yes, but are the signs on the second floor close to, I'm, I'm trying to remember where the science lab and that academic are within. Good, the tremendous place. question. Uh, the science lab's on the existing building on the third floor, and they're positioned there so that the utilities and the exhausting can occur through a roof. And so with the addition of the new one, there wasn't the capacity to go take over roof space because it wasn't designed for that in the first, in the, in the first iteration of the campus but we followed the same principle to place them on the second floor so that all the utilities and the exhausting could occur at a roof level. Okay. Have a motion? So move. Second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded that we approve the design development for the Woodlands College Park High School renovations. Any other questions or comments? Yes, I have one. And, uh, this may be of Dr. Stockton, I'm not sure, but uh, Usually when we add on to a high school like we did Conroe High School this past two years that we've been working on it, we count it by the number of students that we can add because we're adding those seats and classrooms and so on and so forth. Uh, w what is this going to change from and to the capacity of College well, Park? The p capacity right now is probably 20, between 22 and 2300, it's approximately 2800. Up to 2,800. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? 
vote. All in favor, if you'd raise your hand. Opposed by the same sign, motion carries. So we have um, Conroe High School. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Pollock, this is actually a, a design you've seen at the last board meeting. We've got a, a little addition to it we'd like you to see. Paul? Thank you very much, Mr. Stockton. Uh, and the characterization is, is absolutely perfect. Last uh, meeting, we brought to you uh, the design development work for the campus improvements on Conroe High School. And the design process involves an awful lot of interaction with people and interviews and, and sort of an iterative process where you ask questions and you get feedback and you make adjustments. And in the process of visiting with the campus staff, a topic came up that uh, addressed a question that we had about the front door of the facility. And so we asked the question, would it be appropriate to bring to the board one element of this that would, would represent a change to what you'd seen before? And we hope uh, a worthy addition for your consideration. The question has to do with the small area of green space shown on your screen. When we brought this to you the last, last month, that corner of the entry glass, the storefront, the, that represents the true entry to the school, was not designated for a purpose. And we were looking for a reason to either use it or truncate it and not involve that area. And as we got into conversation with campus staff, um, we noticed that the, the campus mascot, the tiger, under glass, is down at the end of the corridor. And we started thinking, what if, just a what if, that's absolutely all it is, what if we pose the question of could we bring that forward and make it more of a showcase element for the campus and use that corner which hadn't previously been utilized? And so having said that, we had that dialogue with the campus staff, then we asked administrative staff, would this be appropriate to bring to you, and to bring you some visualizations of that to explain it, and then ask your pleasure how to proceed. So that is the corner, and so it would occur on at that very main front entry sort of focal point on the right-hand side. This is the area that is represented by that display area, and so it would be effectively front and center. It would be to the viewer's right as you walk into the school and enter the school doors. And it's hard to depict underneath, but we think that the visualization might be something like this. And so as you approach those front doors, you would see to your right, or have the potential of seeing the tiger mascot in glass, secured, um, and accessible through a door to the inside, um, but presented to each of your patrons as they come to the school. And so again, this is a, a, a small detail, but it has a significant impact to what occurs on the front of the building. We think it's very appropriate and necessary for you to offer your opinion. And, what, what would you do with that space where it is now? What what change does, does that make to that in it? Or do you just well, put please, something else in there? You, where it's at right now? Yeah. Well, Mr. Crowell's in the audience. Uh, and I don't know, the question, Mike, is what would you do with that space if we move the Tiger? One of the things that we talked about, not really the utilization of that space, but from a standpoint of um, protecting the Tiger, <laughs> Is there, I guess over the years there's been a few accidents with people running into the tiger to move it. So it was more of a, you know, just not necessarily utilizing a little more of the space, but putting the tiger somewhere more prominent. I don't know if you'd use the extra space or not. It's at the end of the hallway. <laughs> move from. 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 Yeah. Just open it up. <laughs> that wasn't being critical. It's a curiosity question. Right. What we were going to do with that that area? So, yeah, we basically looked at this. This was dead space here. There wasn't going to be anything there. So we talked about showcasing it a little bit. And Mr. Powell, I'll get with you later. I apologize since I wasn't able to attend the last board meeting. We have improved the security. At the entrance. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll get with you and see that. Right. And I would just say that um, in the content, we'd be happy to bring you additional copies of. There's a double door security entrance, as we've done for you on your other schools. That whole entryway becomes the lobby. I move the approval. Second. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded that we approve the design development for Conroe High School renovations. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, if you'll raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yes. Uh, design, design development for Flex 12 and Flex 14.
Thank you again, Dr. Stockton. And I apologize. I feel like I'm monopolizing your time, but these are the first projects rolling out from the bond, <laughs> and there are some pace issues in terms of keeping uh, current with your schedule, and we'll try and be brief, but also answer any questions you have. Uh, Flex 12 and Flex 14, uh, just numerically, have, were identified as part of the bond development process to occur on a property that you've considered recently and took action on and now presently own. And that's the multi, what we've, what we've planned uh, with your assistance as the multi-school site located off of 336 and FM 3083. This is a, just a, a representation of that site and where it occurs in the northeast corner of Conroe ISD uh, and the city of Conroe. Uh, this is an aerial depiction of Flex 12 and Flex 14. Now keeping in mind that Flex 12 is the only piece that actually starts, one of our considerations we asked the district, seemed appropriate to us, is to consider anything you do as a first step in the context of what might occur not only for 14, but potentially down the road, because the planning involved potential for future. Again, uh, yes, sir. Give me, uh, which one of those is 336? The, the the road to the far horizon is 336. Oh, that's the road 336. Close to, yes, sir. 336 running. And, and At the top right. of the page. So both right. of these schools actually face 3083. 30 that's correct. Okay. okay, thanks. Yes, sir. What is this right that's a and, new road. And, and of those two, the viewer to the left-hand side of the image, that is Flex 12. And that is planned as an intermediate school. And so just simply as a depiction, we're trying to show the potential for where 12 and 14 are, are planned to occur and that there is other space on this site that could support anything the district chooses or needs to do down the road. Having said that, the uh, the pieces uh, or the or the information presented to you tonight relates specifically to Flex 12 and Flex 14. Okay. The layout of these two schools is is organized around uh, a pattern that you've used before uh, successfully, or we believe successfully, for Flex 9 and Flex 7, which are the Ben Milam and the Grangerland Replacement School in Caney Creek. And so it seemed to work very well. It expedited construction. It represented cost savings in terms of infrastructure on that site. And so w this is the proposal we have for you to to organize these two schools much the same way. Uh, there's also a question about identity that we'll get to in just a minute, but these schools uh, are the, the new school, much like the one being done right now for you on, on Ed Carbett Road, Flex 11, and they retain effectively almost all the elements of the other Flex schools that you've done in the past with some expanded classroom space. And this relates to that question of what the front door for Flex 12 might look like. and so. Given that there is a potential to have two schools, well, not a potential, but the reality of having two schools next to each other, we wanted to have the same sort of, of sensitivity to have an identity that's different for one school compared to Flex 14, and then uh, enable it so that the opportunity to have unique identities for anything else the district does, does with that site anywhere down the road, that there wouldn't be multiple schools sharing the same type of uh, front door. Uh, this is the, the front entry. Uh, it's familiar within Conroe ISD, if you'll recall. This is what Grangerland Intermediate looks like. Similarly, Cryer, uh, well. For Flex 14, which is not planned to commence right away, but is planned for this site and is a component of the 2008 bond, that's sort of the mirror image on this campus. Again, it, it, it has all the same kind of components and the parts and pieces that are, are familiar within Conroe ISD for a Flex school with the additional classroom space that uh, that was enrolled recently. And then with the barrel vault entrance that you've seen, uh, not only at Ben Milan, but also at Derrichen. The the elements, the project schedule related to this is that we, we stand ready to complete the construction documents this week, issue them to the contract that you identified, and obtain proposals for you. The goal is to bring them to you in, in August of this year and to uh, hopefully have a favorable GMP presentation so that you can begin construction right away and open the facility in July and August of next year. Uh, the construction start and completion dates for Flex 14 remain to be determined, but the contractor is where you, uh, you endorsed and approved. Yes, sir. I've just got to ask the question how you can build a Flex school by July of 2009 and yet the additions to College Park will take until 2010. Did I miss something, or is it just that much more complex? Or I, I'm just asking in general. Sure. I don't have a complaint sure. about it. No, sir. I, I, there's actually there's two keys. One is you've already enabled some of the construction work on the Flex 12 and 14 site. You took you approved some site work, 
And so those schools historically take between 13 and 14 months. And so you've done what we think is a terrific thing and done some of the work already. You'll be in by July 09. The difference is that the 90, almost 95,000 square feet of additions at College Park are occurring on an occupied campus. There will be some things that occur that will simply take longer to exercise some safety and some precautions for the residents on the campus. Uh, you know, in makes sense. So, and in terms of, of size and area, they're pretty close. You know, the flex school is a little bit larger, the additions are a little bit smaller, but the nature of the campus affects that. Thank My you. My guess, too, is that with number 12, we have 11 under our belt. So That's correct. We're, we've done 11 of them, so they're, it's... They're about to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> The other project details related to cost and who your contractor is, um, again, uh, the Planning and Construction Department went through uh, the state-required selection process for contractors. Uh, it was very successful. You enrolled good contractors that have done these schools for you before. They were measured competitively in terms of their quantified proposals to you. Your budget for Flex 12 from the 2008 bond is, is identified. Completion is identified. The budget for Flex 14 is the same but the scheduled completion date will be determined by Conroe ISD. Second. Second. Motion been made and seconded that we approve the design development for Flex 12 and 14. Any other comments or questions? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Mr. Powell, we'll go back Excellent. to you for the new junior high school on Longmire Road. Thank you, Dr. Stockton. And this is last, so I'll, I'll be out of your hair very briefly. This is the first junior high school that would come forward as part of the 2008 bond election. And I believe um, uh, the site perhaps is somewhat familiar to you. It is located on Longmire Street, uh, what I would consider north of, of Conroe High School. It's a 60-acre site. I believe it's under contract at the moment. Mr. Cox and, and, and also Mr. Burns and Mr. Bollinger have done a terrific job of organizing your site purchases. This, is, this reflects that same kind of issue, to have that done in advance so that the rollout is as, as efficient for you and as economical for you as you can. Uh, it is, uh, it's a different site than many that we've seen. It's got some significant topography from one corner to the other. If you look at this drawn site plan, if you view the left-hand side of this of the image uh, as being the high point of the site, which it truly is, the, the right-hand side of the image is low, and it's probably 40 feet lower than the left-hand side. And while that represents some great opportunities to have some interesting views and these sorts of things, it represents some technical challenges as far as how you manage putting a building and facilities on it. But we think that uh, uh, Congress come up with a pretty interesting application of a junior high school plan that you've done before in a terrific way that helps solve some of that. The plan that was that was uh, presupposed by the bond planning was to utilize the plan for New York Junior High School, which had as its point of beginning Branch Crossing. And if you look on the right-hand side, the right-hand side represents the academic areas of the New York Junior High School. If you'll, if you'll recall, that's the two-story part of the building. And so I'm going to back up, if I may, just one point. You'll notice that it's on the right-hand side. And so we went through different siting exercises with staff, administrative staff, to ask what's the best way to configure this. And we were trying to think, how can we mitigate some of the slope, the contour of the land? And so we asked the question, how would you feel if we took that two-story volume, simply pushed the first floor down to a lower level, and literally removed every bit of that site component that would have involved filling and layers and all this other cost, to simply place it down low? So where in Branch Crossing or in, in the New York Junior High School, you approach the stairs from the commons and you go upstairs to the second floor, you will now go straight across at grade at the same elevation from the commons area into the science areas. The library still stays up, but the other components of the academic area effectively save you all of that site development cost by simply following the contour of the land. So we thought that was a, a neat application and an appropriate one, and, and so we, we've organized the plan in that respect. I'm going to take the liberty of scrolling fairly quickly through the site blow-ups. It is, it is effectively a duplication of the elements and the parts and pieces in the New York Junior High School. 
staff has reviewed and evaluated. Quit calling it the New York yeah. Junior High School. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, sir. I'll never do that again. I'll read, I'll read in the Courier that we named the school after New York. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, I'm simply not able to articulate. Well, I've been trying to pause between the new and York, so if there's a clear distinction. York, <laughs> York Junior High School looks a lot like this. And this is uh, our visualization for the front door for the school. Again, sharing a lot of the same elements as you've seen before. And a view from the street level for the same campus. The library. As with the other projects, we certainly want to bring you project details related to schedule as well as cost. Uh, we propose to complete construction documents uh, in the first part of the year, probably about February. Issue documents to the contractor that you've identified. See sub-proposals in the spring. Bring you a GMP um, uh, that matches the, the, the bond predicted amount in May in construction and have the project completed for you by 2011, which was the predicted date in the 2008 bond. Uh, your contractor, uh, the one who was most competitive as well as representing the best experience qualifications for the project is Marshall Construction. The budget amount shown is straight from the financial data in the bond um, package. Schedule completion date is as shown. And uh, as with all the other projects, I'd certainly be anxious to answer any questions you might have. Any questions or comments? Do I hear a motion? Second. I've got a motion and a second that we approve the design development for the new junior high on Longmire Road. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you very much. for all your work. The design development for San Jacinto Elementary Schools will be presented by Mr. Burns. Uh, once again, we'd like to show you what's uh, been going on for the last three to four months at San Jacinto Elementary. Um, in the bond, uh, we were asked to uh, do about a uh, 16 to 17 uh, classroom addition to this building plus figure out a way to get more queuing of passion cars uh, on the site uh, to get them all 13, 14 in a rather efficient manner. So as it, as it ended up, um, in working with the administration and Mr. Hines, Dr. Hines, uh, we come up with this plan as far as the, the parent drop-off, which will queue up between 40 to 45 cars and get them all 13, 14 rather efficiently. Uh, during uh, the, the day, you see there's a gate up there at the top it will be closed off so passion cars during a recess of time, playground time, they cannot exit or enter the back of this building. They will just take another loop and go back out to 1314. It worked out quite efficient. Uh, it's about a 33,500 square foot addition. Uh, it'll add 17 new classrooms and new library. It's very similar to what we did at uh, Austin last year. Very, very similar in size. Uh, the existing library will be converted into music and other support areas. The existing administration will be turned into a new art studio and where art and music were originally will be turned into more classrooms or, or usable spaces. So uh, we're painting the building. Um, so the library is like 4,200 square feet, which is almost identical to the one at Austin Elementary, brings it up the code. And the, the cafeteria will still support this growth, but it's about to the end of it. This will bring it up to about 846 students total, this edition, if this edition is approved. So the bids will uh, be, go after the bid in July the 14th, uh, come in on August the 7th. Uh, we plan to bring it back to the board on August the 19th uh, for your approval. Construction will start for the 26th of August, or a week within a week either way, and it'll uh, be completed uh, by August the 1st, 09. We made about four passes during the development of this bill and for addition as far as costing, and so far we're, we're still well within our budget, although it has not gone to the public yet. <laughs> Um, Mr. Burns, the only question I have, since we're, we don't have as much detail with this uh, addition as we had with some of the other discussions tonight, is uh, Austin was, um, I'm not sure, San Jacinto or Austin's older, but 
I can't remember, frankly. But uh, also was built in '51. This was built in '79. Uh, in '79. <clears throat> so I assume that we're going to come away with a building like Austin that, uh, albeit changed and albeit added on, it's going to look. Um, it's going to look like it's all one, for lack of better ways to put it. Um, the old part in yellow. We're actually encapsulating that much of existing building. Uh, the brick will be selected to, to be as close as match as possible, even though 25, 26 years later. Uh, we have uh, had some brick uh, manufacturers submit some samples. They're looking real good at this time. The architecture will not do anything really strange at this time. The new front entry will be uh, totally different than what was there before. It's going to be a very defined, which the administration said they want to define um, new entry. Uh, this has a maglock door, so the secretary actually, which is very similar to some of our flex schools, they have to buzz them through. They, they will be able to egress, but they can't ingress. Very good. Thank you. Madam President, yes. so the entry will be redone? Yes. And the curve, the curve. Given a, a comparison, what it will look like comparing like to another school. We don't have one quite like this, and we're trying to get the we're catching the traffic coming into the corner of a building instead of into the middle. Yeah. So we're actually identifying a curve, a large curvature, a large curved uh, facade with a handicap ramp, <clears throat> with all with the new names of the San Jacinto above that door. So it's going to be a very focal point when they when they come to that school, they know exactly where to go. If we walk into the lobby situation, walk into the lobby. Hmm. So it's the yellow rounded yeah, corner. The yellow, Thank you. I'm yellow sorry. Corner. This is the old. Everything in gray is existing. Yeah. Uh, everything in yellow is new, and the blue is where we've done renovations. Okay, show me where the old on, um, entry was. I see where the new is, the lobby. It's in the blue. The first the first blue square. The top, this top side. blue. The bingo. Top. Yeah. Okay, bingo. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Burns, do they have uh, a separate um, cafeteria and a gym? Are those two separate? No, ma'am. Okay, I'm not. Yeah. Okay, and you're saying that the current cafeteria will accommodate the number of students? Yes, ma'am. For will TA it, standards, it will carry, it will handle load. Okay, will it do that without them starting lunch at 10 o'clock? Uh, it's Renee or Miss Renee. Renee's back there. I had separate at 4. A lot of our schools start lunch at 10 40. This, co this cafeteria will handle 290 students per period. You will have a total of 846. So mathematically, it'll work now. As far as how it's used, I can't. I can't tell you. I apologize if you've already shared that. The staff and administration were part of uh, um, input and design. Yeah. They've signed off on it. Uh, We've had several meetings with administration and uh, so O'Neill. Uh, <clears throat> this the cafeteria was discussed, but. There again, for CA standards, which we had, which we go by, it yeah. it will carry 290 per period. If the possibility exists that we wanted to expand that a little bit, is there a feasible way to do that? Yes, ma'am. On the property? Yes, ma'am. If you will look to, to the gray down at the bottom, which is your cafeteria, you have some restrooms. Uh, then you have some little offices right there. We could bump that building out to the south. And increase the dining space. Now the kitchen was renovated uh, last year, and it's a little bit more efficient on serving lines. It's south to the left. Yes. Thank you. Um, just for our information, could you get us some figures on that? Uh, to expand. The, to expand. Uh, just expand that a little bit. South is to the left, Bob. So, or south is to the to the bottom. South is to the bottom, isn't it? So it'd be okay. west. 
anyway to the left. It wouldn't so be a, where the outside doors go to the recess, right? We, we can't. You're, we're, it you're would talking not, about the offices and storage there, right there. That is, is that correct. what you're talking about? That's, That's correct. Fine, the bus stop off. This is a whole kind of a whole kind of kind of that. I think that's S T O R. Your glasses must be better than mine. That's office door. Mr. Burns, uh, on the entrance, just let me ask again, the rounded entrance and what it, the architectural design, I believe, to more capable hands than mine, but basically it's going to be built either like Austin or like one of our flexes where you come in, the, uh, you have an office area, and then that is egress, egress protected. Uh, you know, one, one, you can go one way, but you can't go, in, you can't go in without her knowing. That is correct. And so, regardless of what it architecturally looks like, the it's going to be on that front left corner. The function is the same. Thank you. Um, if you would get us, if if we can do a little bit with that, how how much that would add to to the capacity, and also how much of our how much our if, expenses uh, would if be. If you to do would that. like, we could go ahead and have that uh, incorporate as an as an alternate. Yes. That way, on the night that we bring the GMP, it would be your decision to say, okay, we know exactly down to the dollar what it would be worth if, if okay. that's what you want to do. Yes. That would be very simple. You would do that. Would it put uh, your time frame off if we waited until our July 8th um, special board meeting so we could see a photo of what the entry and the, the dollar amount to the um, if we add on or not really? But you're accomplishing the same thing. Oh, okay. Is that correct? No. Okay. Okay. That's not correct, but that no, we're not going to need. It. At least not at this point. <laughs> so, is it my understanding that the board would like to see an alternate on this on the addition of the cafeteria? We could we could move forward and then see it on yeah. the GMP, okay. and you bring the GMP to us. Would that be all right? That'd be fine. That'd be Still very simple. Okay. So we're approving okay. it is subject to the change and, and the can dollars. Approve an alternate at the next board meeting. The GMP. We'll, we'll bring the, GMP. the GMP. We'll bring the exact. We'll bring them both back. Okay. We'll bring you the basic plan and then with the expanded plan. Okay. It'd be your choice to choose which one you wanted to do. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Move the approval. Second. We have a motion and a second that we approve the design development for San Jacinto Elementary School res uh, renovations. Uh, that's with the stipulation. Okay. Okay. With the stipulation that you bring with us the GMP, the, the alternate. Okay. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay. Um, Mr. Burns, the bond referendum. Update. Okay, uh, Conroe High School. Uh, actually, since this picture was taken uh, the day before yesterday, they have now installed uh, some landscape along this road. I was over a while ago. The sprinkler system has been installed and working. Uh, the building is about 96 to 97 percent complete. Uh, this has been the putting an irrigation system in and fine grading, uh, getting ready for hydro mulch on the LGI. Uh, this is the existing. Uh, corridor or part of it was is from the new to the uh, existing building on the bottom floor and this is the uh, the second floor As you can see it's, uh, it's near very near completion this is one of the new science rooms already cleaned up ready to go a uh, science prep room the building is really moving along quite well york junior high is about 88 to 92 percent complete uh, this is uh, the new entry with the double locked doors. Uh, this is in the commons area. This is the library. This library has turned out really, really handsome. Uh, this is uh, the new, uh, one of the new art rooms. So, uh, oh man, is finishing up the base. This is one of the science classrooms. And uh, there again, one of the uh, preparation rooms between the science classrooms. Uh, Tom Cox Intermediate. There again is about 92% complete. The front entry. Now this, this is the side of the library. Our casework being installed. This is though they're putting the, the wood uh, stage flooring on in the uh, stage area and commons. The gymnasium, which is now complete. The sports complex is about 93% complete. 
Uh, this is uh, in the second floor of the natatorium, looking down the lobby, showing the tile patterns. The uh, swimming pool, and these come along real great. All the uh, decking has been completed now around the pool itself. All the lanes and targets and cross lanes have now been completed for the, the tile. <clears throat> we anticipate plastering starting on June the 28th. It'll take about a, a three-day uh, period. And it's gonna, then we'll start filling full of water, which will take somewhere between four and five days to fill up. And it's moving along quite well. I'll uh, just show you, this is the, uh, the all the mechanical equipment at the back of the building, on the side of it, uh, all operational. Uh, the landscaping and uh, the finished product uh, real close on the, the home side. And you can see that all the trees have now been installed. <clears throat> Mulching is going in. Uh, the lights were stood up over the last week. They were finished up <clears throat> for standing them up on Monday. This is a daytime, sh a daytime shot. Last night at 9.15, the, the, they were powered up for the first time. <clears throat> And it's carrying about 100 foot candles of actual lighting on the field. A uh, concession stand on the home side. Armstrong Elementary. Uh, front of the building. Uh, library offices. Come along very well. If you've been over there in the last couple of days and walked in the existing building, it looks like a bomb's went off. It, uh, <laughs> It really looks rough right now, <laughs> but but it will be ready better. in August. Yes. Right? It will look better. It was planned. It's all planned <laughs> because it was the day school was out. Custode was very gracious. They had everything moved out over the weekend. Monday morning, a contractor hit it with a with an army of folks, and it's they have dumpsters lined up around the outside of the parking lot. And it's they're filling them up and hauling them off as fast as they can. The uh, transportation facility is about 88% complete. Uh, this is in the transportation looking toward the mezzanine. Uh, the custodial loading dock uh, is now complete. The building is looking very nice. We should take over oh, possession sometime in the second week of July. Runyon, uh, if you're familiar with Runyon, it had a, the uh, 1965, I call it hospital green ceramic tile and everything. Uh, that's now being uh, taken away. So sad. It's, uh, it's moving. It's moving. You can on. actually see it on the top there. Uh -huh. That's still yeah. sand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that looks so much. Aren't you gonna miss? It? Everybody's got ceramic tile. I like the green stuff. Kind of anti you know? Once they Retro. get once they get the trazo, everything cleaned up and polished, it's gonna look. And we're getting all the new doors, all new hardware, all ADA approved. Uh, we're renovating the restrooms, bringing them up to. Uh, Speed, and um, I think you. I think you're going to be quite pleased with the way the building's going to turn out. And that's it. Very good. And we think you need something else to do. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. As, as we uh, get to the near to the end of the 2004 bond implementation, you should be very proud. We've the facilities have come along beautifully. And it's because of your direction, so thank you. Well done. Thank you. We'll move along to item 6A, the approval of the amendment to the GMP. Mr. Cox, please. Before I get into this, I just want to let you know that our financial advisors and bond councils are sitting over here feeling really good <laughs> after watching all these de design development presentations and knowing that they're going to be very busy for the next <laughs> few, few years. Uh, <clears throat> this is approval of amendment to the GMP for stadium and natatorium. I recommend that the Board of Trustees approve the amendment to the GMP for the stadium and natatorium. As you've just seen from Bobby's presentation, we're very excited that we're nearing completion of the sports complex. We do need to, we do have the need for a, a modest change order uh, submitted by Tellepson, uh, amendment in the amount of 331,568 necessary to complete the project. The new GMP will now be 38,728,330 uh, for the stadium and natatorium. Uh, the GMP change items have been <laughs> extensively reviewed and approved by administration and planning and construction. 
And I recommend that the amendment to the GMP be approved. So moved. There's been a motion and a second that we approve the GMP um, for the stadium and the new GMP for the stadium and natatorium. natatorium sorry. Uh, any comments or questions? Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item 6B, Dr. Mr. Cox, I'll just turn this over to you. Uh, this, uh, uh, this item is an, uh, approve the order for the sale of the bonds and the refunding. Uh, unfortunately, the bond market uh, hasn't been as good to us the last few weeks as we'd hoped, so we decided to defer the refunding portion. Uh, and so we're here tonight uh, to uh, recommend the approval of the order authorizing the issuance of Conroe Independent School District uh, unlimited tax school building uh, bonds, and that's going to have to be modified slightly by our bond council, which they have modified them and have the correct stuff here. Uh, I want to uh, turn it over at this time to Frank Ildebrando and John Roebuck with RBC Dane Rousher. But before I do that, I also want to introduce Tom Sage uh, uh, and his associate James Garrett Elkins. They're here tonight. They they have done all the the bond council work. Of course, our financial advisors have done a great job in uh, successfully selling the 85 million today. Uh, but we did decide uh, at the last minute to pull the, the refunding uh, because the, the bond market just wasn't right. There was a savings there, but it wasn't at a level that we were comfortable with, so we decided to defer that to a later date. As you know, the bond market's been going, uh, it's been hit or miss lately, and, and uh, it was hit a couple of weeks ago, and it missed today. So, <laughs> or it actually missed for the last week. Anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Frank. Good evening, uh, Ms. Asser, members of the board. Uh, there's a stock on the, I'm Frank Elderbrando with RBC Capital Markets. We're here this evening, as Dan has indicated, to uh, adopt an order authorizing the issuance of 84,885,000 of unlimited tax schoolhouse bonds. Excuse me for being a bit tardy. I was babysitting my grandchildren, <laughs> two, four, and six, and I don't know how you Anybody can get dressed when they're around. <laughs> <laughs> That's why am I without a tie tonight? <laughs> yes, I'll do that in a minute. Let me get dressed. Um, but I was uh, uh, I was substituted I, by my wife and my son. They got home in time for me to come up. So uh, we are again here this evening to review the uh, um, uh, sale of eighty four million eight hundred eighty five thousand. As you, uh, I'm sure you're aware, we were selling eighty five million dollars worth of bonds. The, uh, uh, the, the underwriters did pay a premium for the bond issue, so we will receive $85 million in bond proceeds to, to go forward with our, with our projects. Uh, a little bit of good news, uh, uh, our credit rating was upgraded by Standard & Poor's from an A-plus to a double-A. Uh, so both the rating agencies now carry us as a double-A, a which is the second highest uh, rating available to a school district uh, besides the triple-A permanent school fund guarantee, and we did apply for that, and we received that last Thursday. <laughs> so we did go to market with an excellent credit rating and an excellent underlying rating, and I believe we are, uh, we did very well. The first page of the presentation is a pretty much a history of the bond buyer index, and we've talked about this before. This is pretty much our Dow Jones of the bond business. As you can see, this is a pretty much about a 20-year history of that, and if you look at the, uh, uh, the past uh, years, you can see that we are still in an excellent uh, market environment. Uh, interest rates are uh, below average for that period of time and still below <coughs> uh, the, the levels that we predicted uh, in our bond program. So while the market has tweaked up us on, on us the last uh, couple of weeks, we are still in an excellent market environment. And we can demonstrate that by the following page, as you can see. Uh, late last year, or early, excuse me, early this year, bond market peaked uh, in uh, in January and February, and we, we had a nice down trend for the past three or four months, but it's it's beginning to rise again, and I think that's the effect of of oil in the in the market and the concern of the, uh, uh, the underwriters and traders and the people that set these markets that inflation might be on, <laughs> on its way. So we've seen a a, a tweak up, but again. 
can still say we're in an, in an excellent market uh, environment. The following page is a summary of the bond sale. We did sell $84,885,000 worth of bonds. They paid a net premium of nearly $800,000. It was $684,000 in expenses related to the bond sale. So we, we received net proceeds of $85,000. Our average true interest cost, including expenses, is a 4.91%. The average maturity on these bonds is approximately over 20 years. The following schedule is, um, is uh, a, a summary or analysis of the current bond debt to the far left-hand side, the current total debt service that we currently have outstanding. That's all our bonds of, uh, and interest. Then we add the $84 million in new debt to the far right-hand column. Then will be our actual debt service of, uh, uh, as it would exist after this bond, these bonds have sold. Um, this is approximately $1.2 million less than we predicted in the bond program in interest cost. So we are, again, below what we, we've been running all our analysis at, so we still feel we're right on target with our projections with respect to tax rates and, and such as, as, as we predicted in our bond program. Uh, the, the, the remainder of the analysis is just the summary of uh, the Standard & Poor's report. Uh, uh, showing why our rating was increased to a, tri uh, to a double A. That's good nighttime reading, and I believe that is also followed by the Moody's Investment Service report. Uh, we do believe the uh, Merrill Lynch, your, your lead underwriter, and, and their partners did an excellent job uh, uh, the last uh, few days in, in marketing the bonds. It, it, it has been a very tough market. As you may have read in the local paper here recently, uh, some of the bond issuers locally were not able to sell their bonds. Uh, they had delayed sale of the bonds. So I think uh, we, we did well in the marketplace at, 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 at this time, and, uh, and I would recommend that you do approve the sale of the bonds to uh, Merrill Lynch and the, uh, their associate in underwriters. If there's any questions related to the sale of the bonds, this analysis of uh, or the bond program, I'll be happy to answer that. So moved, Madam Second. President. Motion has been made and seconded that we approve the order author authorizing the issuance of Conroe Independent School District unlimited tax school building um, bonds. And uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. All right. Motion carries. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you for all your hard work on our behalf. Thank you. We'll uh, only be in the bank in about 30 days. It's really good to see. I, I, I do live in, in the school district. It's really good to see the, the 2004 bond program come and see these updates see the schools going up and, and looking forward to the, uh, uh, the new buildings, this bond program. This is the first one of this authorization. I think the rest of them are going to go very, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item 6C, Dr. Stockton. Mr. Cox, I'll turn this over to you. I recommend that the Board of Trustees approve the resolution authorizing the substitution of remarketing agent for the Conroe Independent School District unlimited tax adjustable rate current interest refunding bonds and unlimited tax capital appreciation refunding bond series 2004B. Uh, you have in your packet a, a draft resolution which has now been finalized by our bond council uh, naming Goldman Sachs as the new remarketing agent for Conroe Independent School District adjustable rate bond series 2004B. Uh, the current remarketing agent, UBS, has decided to exit the public finance market. Uh, our financial advisors uh, recommended that we select Goldman Sachs as our new remarketing agent, so I recommend that you approve. So moved, Madam President. Do I hear a second? Second. The motion has been made and seconded to approve the resolution authorizing the substitution of the remarketing agent for the Conroe Independent School District. Unlimited tax adjustable rate current interest refunding bonds and unlimited tax capital appreciation refunding bonds series 2004B. Questions or comments? All in favor, if you'd raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Item 6D, Dr. Stockton. Okay, 6D is our preliminary 2008-2009 budget information. Mr. Cox is back. Uh, having presented information a couple of months ago, back to present some more information as we work on the budget. 
Glad to be here uh, to discuss the preliminary budget for 2007-2008-2009. Uh, You'll recall we had a budget workshop in February. Uh, we're now back with a more defined budget proposal. Uh, our theme, as you will recall, uh, was the, this year was new facilities. We're opening seven new facilities, and our objective is to minimize the impact on our budget surplus. Uh, and we think we're going to be able to do that. Before we get into uh, uh, discussion of the 2008-2009 uh, budget, I'd like to take a moment and review the results for 07-08. Uh, our undesignated general fund balance is over 20 percent. You'll recall a few years ago we set uh, a goal of an objective of maintaining a general fund balance of 15 to 20 percent. We're sitting at 21 percent this year. Uh, once again, our budget presentation uh, and CAFR, uh, we received the budget presentation and CAFR awards from ASBO and GFOA. Uh, ASBO is the Association of School Business Officials. And I looked it up today, there are only 13 school districts uh, in the state of Texas are receiving both of these awards from ASBO. Uh, we have received them for over the, the last 10 years. Uh, also, the GFOA is Government Finance Officers Association. Uh, we're very proud to receive both of these awards. Also, once again, uh, we received a su superior achievement rating for the year ended August 31, 2007 for the Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, and we successfully achieved all indicators in the first rating system. We received a clean audit from Deloitte and Touche, which uh, we're obviously very proud of and, and expect to occur every time. Uh, we lowered the tax rate 35 cents to $1.24 for a total reduction over the last two years of 52 cents. We believe that if that's not the lowest, it's one of the, it's one of the largest reductions in the last two years of any school district in the state. Uh, it's the lowest one. We have not seen another one higher than that, but I'm not saying that couldn't be, but we're very proud of that. Uh, we're nearing successful completion, as you just heard, of the 2004 bond program. We added 61 unplanned classrooms which is equivalent of adding another elementary school of 1,200 students. Uh, we began construction of the bonus elementary school, which involved no new debt. It was funded from the 06-07 budget surplus and capital projects fund interest income. Uh, as you can see, 07-08 has been another outstanding year financially. However, I want to point out that uh, we will see a much more challenging financial environment going forward. However, the good news is that our challenge is going to be how to manage our surplus uh, while many districts are already faced with the challenge of managing a deficit budget. So uh, that puts us in a very favorable position relative to uh, in, in our local environment. And we're again proud of that. Also, before we get into the budget, we'd like to take a moment uh, to compare how we stand how our budget compares to the state averages uh, uh, from a, by function. And this is something you've seen before, and so, uh, you know, it's, it hasn't changed dramatically. Some positive things, uh, one of the things that, that I, we've all wanted to do is we're actually closing the gap on instruction spending. You're seeing our instruction spending go up as a percent of our budget. Uh, to where we're at 58.7 percent, and th this is based on the 0607 budget, by the way. That's the latest data that's in PEAMS. Uh, so, uh, in, but you are seeing that gap close. Uh, once again, we're high in uh, uh, transportation and student support services, which is primarily counselors, and we're low in several other areas, including central administration. Uh, We've been looking, as you know, we've been monitoring uh, our spending uh, compared to the state average, and you see uh, that we continue, we continue to spend substantially less than the state average. And, and one of the things we're proud of is our goal is to achieve excellent academic outcomes in a cost-effective manner, and we're proud that we are achieving that goal. We also like to compare our tax rates to our local peer group. 
Uh, a year ago, we were second to lowest tax rate. We felt at that time that we would become the lowest tax rate, and I'm happy to say that, as predicted, we now have the lowest tax rate among our peer group, and we expect to maintain that position going forward. We also monitor our fund balance. Uh, as I mentioned, our goal was to have a fund balance in the range of 15 to 20 percent of the budget. Uh, because we were in excess of that, we were able to dedicate a, a significant portion of the fund balance this past year. Surplus, uh, which would have gone into the fund balance, was $14 million. We have now transferred that $14 million to the Capital Projects Fund for the bonus school. And if you've driven down Ed Carbett Road, you've seen that $14 million being put to work, as Dr. Brown saw today, because he told me that he saw clearing project taking place. And so that's uh, that's that $14 million being put to work. Yes. I, maybe I should wait and not interrupt you. Do you prefer that? No, go uh, ahead. 20 to 21 percent budget surplus. What is that 1 percent represented in dollars? Uh, Three million dollars. Thank you. Uh, our budget is approximately $300 million. Thank you. So, uh, we that's were, close enough. That, yeah, that's right. what uh, we anticipate adding approximately one to three million to the fund balance uh, at August 31. So, right now we're anticipating uh, recent numbers of ADA have come in higher than we expected. So, uh, that's good from a, a surplus. That's going to we expect to have a one to three million dollar surplus this year. And we're already at 21 percent of budget. Well, yeah, but our budget's going up, so I understand. Uh, the numbers change a little. But but for for 07, 07 08, our sixty two and a half million was twenty one percent of the budget. So we were sitting at twenty one percent. Looking at enrollment, uh, enrollment is the uh, critical factor in the current in in the current school finance system. Uh, so a positive trend is good from a funding standpoint, and it's good from a local economy standpoint, uh, a healthy environment. But you can see that we continue to maintain a steady upward trend. Uh, we have experienced a 50 percent increase in enrollment over the past 10 years, and we've basically been in that, that, 50, that general range uh, consistently for the last five years. <clears throat> Looking at more detailed attendance data, if you'll notice uh, uh, in the last four years, in 2006, we, we, had, we saw a significant step up in enrollment growth, and we've consistently maintained that level since then. Our average enrollment growth uh, has, per year over the last 10 years has been 1570. Our ADA average growth has been 1539 for a 4.5% average growth rate. However, for the last four years, you've seen that those numbers have been uh, significantly higher than that. Uh, and we're projecting uh, for 2000, for 08, 09, uh, 08 09, we're projecting uh, enrollment growth of 1,998. We're using 2,000 in the budget. Uh, for ADA, we're projecting 1,695, and we're using 1,700 in the budget. Uh, so we expect this trend to continue in the range of 2,000 a year or better for the coming year. Certified property values, uh, although m and funding is not affected by appraised value changes, uh, that money goes to the state. It definitely uh, impacts our debt service, and our debt service depends on appraised values. So uh, uh, this is a benefit to us to see growth in this area from, from a debt service standpoint. Last 10 years have averaged 11.31 percent. We're projecting 10.15 percent based on the latest numbers we have from the appraisal district. We work with TASB on our compensation. Uh, we, we're currently working under a, a GPI recommendation of 3.5 percent. <coughs> Uh, we did ask TASB to uh, do a special plan review of some of our para and auxiliary positions. 
Uh, this primarily affected uh, police and campus paras. Uh, those were areas that that uh, we are seeing some upgrades uh, from a uh, compensation recommendation. Those were areas that were clearly below market. Uh, and so our, our salary recommendations uh, do include some adjustments in those areas. Teacher raise is recommended at $1,710 a year with a few equity adjustments in the years 12 to 16, which you'll see when we look at the schedule, and a starting teacher salary of 43000 uh, The cost of the 0809 salary increases is approximately $8.2 million. We believe that the 3.5% increase will be equal to or greater than most of the districts in our, general, our area. Uh, we've been seeing uh, raises uh, some in the as low as 2% up to 3.5%. We have not seen any over 3.5% this time. This is the proposed teacher schedule at this time based on the 3.5 GPI. Uh, you can see in the years 12 through 16 that we have some recommended equity adjustments. We're very proud of what we've achieved over the last four years in this area. Starting salaries have increased $9,000. Uh, average teacher pay has increased approximately $10,000. Uh, we believe that teacher salaries are now are competitive with other uh, jobs in, 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 the, in the business world for students getting out of college, and, and we're, finding, we're seeing the results in the fact that we're finding uh, people excited about going to work for Conroe ISD. Uh, the equity adjustments in years 12 through 16 are, we believe these are the final special adjustments to our teacher salary schedule to complete the process that we started four years ago to not only raise our teacher salaries but to make them a more equitable system. So uh, we think that we've achieved that now. Uh, this schedule is our position changed by department. Uh, we're recommending uh, $8.5 million in campus positions and support positions of $1.4 million for a total of $9.9 million. Ironically, this is exactly the same amount of increase that we had last year, and that we're doing that at a time when we're opening seven new facilities. Uh, we're actually quite pleased with that. And we have, I, I will say, that administration has gone over these recommendations extensively. <coughs> We have made a number of adjustments, uh, but we're quite satisfied with what we're recommending and, and we can get the job done. So uh, that's the that's the sour the, the new position recommendations for the year. And now we move on to a schedule that uh, a, a slide that we looked at back in February uh, when I spoke to you about the fact that the state has added two more, uh, potentially added two more enriched pennies uh, <coughs> to the options available to school districts. Uh, and I recommended at that time that we raise our m and tax rate from $1.03 to $1.04 to access one of these additional pennies. We, we can go up to $1.04 without a rollback election, so that penny is available to us. It will increase our revenue, from our state revenue. It will increase our total revenue. Uh, this will make more money available to subsidize our debt service. Uh, in essence, it's another one of those cases where we raise a penny on one side and we uh, avoid uh, a bigger raise on the other side, really. So I am recommending, I will be recommending that we raise our MO tax rate <laughs> one cent to a dollar four in order to access this additional enriched penny. The famous super penny, if you'll recall. <laughs> Do you have it with you? Just thought, just in case somebody. Okay, we're uh, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> Way to be on the ball, Mr. Cox. <laughs> okay, looking at uh, the first pass, and again, I should want to uh, uh, specify that this is preliminary. Uh, but this is where our budget stands today. Uh, in February, we looked at the revenue side. The uh, only real adjustment we've made on the revenue side is a tweaking of the AV growth number, uh, the 10.15%. Uh, 
Uh, and then also, uh, if you'll recall, in February we were talking about a reduction of interest earnings of $1.5 million. We've increased that to $3 million now because of the further uh, decline in interest rate, rates for overnight deposits. Um, <clears throat> so that brings our total revenues to $13 million increase. Uh, on the expense side, which is really what drives our budget, uh, you see the $8.2 million for salary increases, which we talked about a minute ago. Uh, the next three lines are the total $9.9 million for new positions. Uh, the next line is fuel and supplies, $1.9 million. This is principally fuel and supplies for our new facilities. Uh, Utilities and other, uh, once again, principally electricity and utilities for our new facilities. Uh, we do have a reduction of expenses of three and a half million. In the past, last year we had three and a half million in for bus and land purchases. Uh, that will now, for the next few years, we'll be uh, making those purchases with bond funds. Uh, and then we added into the budget 500000 for life cycle projects that, are, that we did not put in the bond program. This brings us to a total expenses of $18.6 increase, uh, which leaves us with a decline in our budget surplus of $5.6 making available for a uh, subsidy for debt service of $12.4 uh, <clears throat> So that's where we stand right now. Uh, this, by the way, the 18.6 million is a 6.3 percent increase in the budget. And when you consider that our essentially our our enrollment growth is growing at a, a, almost about four uh, percent, then it's really a modest additional increase over that. What do you think with the price of gas, all of that, and we are very much uh, driven. Uh, a, a, trans, a transportation uh, centered uh, district. Uh. Well, we put uh, we we were three hundred thousand short this year in our uh, fuel budget. So we uh, we made up that three hundred thousand and then added uh, another how much five hundred or six hundred thousand. So we had like nine hundred thousand increase for fuel. Uh, we we. Uh, you know, we're we're not sure if it's enough, but we we think we can handle the budget. But, but we made a significant increase in fuel. But when you, even though fuel's going up substantially, still the biggest numbers we have are in salary, salary increases, new positions. It's eighty five percent of our budget. So uh, you know, small increases there are a big number. Okay, uh, any other questions about that? If you look at the next slide, what obviously as we continue to evaluate the budget, uh, and remember our objective uh, in terms of managing our tax rate is to minimize the reduction of the subsidy to debt service because uh, as we reduce, every for every $2 million we reduce the subsidy, our, our debt service tax rate is going to go up about 1%, one cent. So, so uh, obviously that's our objective. Uh, the uh, Some of the options that we have, if you look at reducing, uh, we, it, obviously salary increases is a huge number. Every quarter percent in the GPI is $500,000. Uh, we also can reduce, we have 20 unallocated teacher positions in the budget. We've already worked out a way to reduce that number to 15, so you're going to see a $250,000 savings or reduction of expenses that's going to be in the budget next time you see it. We, <coughs> could, we do have some options to go further on that. Explain to me what an unallocated teacher position What What we do is we use... When I first came here, we put 10 unallocated positions a year in the budget. And what that is, is particularly in elementary school, you got 22 to 1 limit. Okay. You go over 22, you need another class. Okay. So you're budgeting for uh, stuff that you may not need, but it's there in case well, you Well, uh, what I'll tell you is that last year we went to 20 because we kept going over 10, used all 20. Uh, 
So now the good news is even if it's not in the budget and we have to have it, we're going to do it and you have more students. To some degree, it's self-funding. Uh, and that's why at the end of the year, your, your ADA numbers come in higher than expected because you got more. But your, but your budgeting positions, you just don't know where they're going to be yet. Exactly. Okay. And and we don't necessarily know that they're going to be filled. <laughs> but history has told us that they will be filled. Okay. One of the challenges is with 22 to 1 uh, through fourth grade, if you get that 23rd student, you may have a, a grade level that's well below 22 to 1. The student may come into a grade level that's at 22 to 1. Um, so it's, a, it's not an exact science until they show up and, and we find out where they show up. The, uh, so basically, I guess it was last year was the first year we went to 20 uh, because we had been going over 10 every year. But the 15, uh, like I said, we've we've been able to move five of these positions over to some federal grant funds. So at 15, we'll still have 20. So if we wanted to lower that to five more, we could. It wouldn't necessarily prevent us from adding 20, <laughs> but but it wouldn't be in the budget, whatever. Uh, and then finally, we have the option of acts. As I said, we're going to put uh, another. Uh, one to three million in the uh, fund balance. We expect the fund balance to be in the range of 63 to 65 million. Uh, we could, uh, if we wanted to uh, access some of that, we could. And then, uh, you know, chances are we're going to have a budget surplus again, and, and we wouldn't end, we wouldn't end up needing to access. Mr. Cox, what's the magic number, and how much does it have the, the exact amount of our general fund balance? Um, have to do with our rate bond ratings. In other words, is twenty percent the magic number? Fifteen. You, uh, you know, we tell them when we talk to them that we have a. They ask if we have a a, a board policy, and we say no. We have a stated objective of of maintaining a fund balance between fifteen and twenty percent. We tell them that uh, in recent years we've been on the high end of that, and so we've settled in currently at around 20 percent. But they seem to be quite comfortable with us staying in that 15 to 20 percent range. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, once again, the next slide is a slide that we looked at. Uh, Back in February, and, and it's a very important slide because uh, it kind of uh, uh, lays out the thing that we're trying to manage, which is the, the fact that uh, when we passed the 2004 bond referendum, we projected a debt service tax rate of 35 cents. A year and a half ago, a year ago, February, we were talking about the budget and we were projecting that our but our tax rate for 0708 would be 29 cents however as you'll recall we ended up making the maneuver where we took the enriched pennies and we used that money to pay down the debt service so we put 18 million dollars from our MO budget over to our debt service fund uh, and we were able to lower our debt service tax rate from 29 cents to 21 cents now, as we reduce that subsidy coming from M and O, for every two million that we reduce it, we're going to see that debt service rate uh, bump back up. So uh, you can kind of do the math and figure out. Obviously, uh, the the more we can <laughs> minimize that uh, reduction in the subsidy, the more the the lower we can keep the debt the debt service tax rate. But basically, uh, each two million reduction in the in the subsidy will raise the debt service tax rate one penny. Final slide. Uh, this is something we looked at last year. Uh, key budget data. I think it's it's. There's nothing really critical about this. It's just information you might want to be aware of. Uh, you can see our assessed value, as we saw before, went up. To its 10 projected 10.15 to 18.3 billion uh, enrollment 48.5 
projected ADA 44883, projected WADA, which is a very important funding number, is 55688. And you may have heard a number thrown out uh, recently by some of the school districts called the target revenue number. Our, I didn't put it on here, I should have, but our target revenue number for this year is 5,078, uh, <clears throat> which is really tied. That and, and WADA and ADA tend to be the, the key numbers in funding. Uh, wealth per student. Uh, wealth per WADA is uh, 328. We've gone up to 328. The Chapter 41 status for next year will be 364.5. So uh, once again, uh, that continue as our wealth per water goes up, the state, uh, the Chapter 41 uh, number goes up as well. So I'm, it's one of those things. It's kind of like chasing your tail. I, it's not something we want to catch. We don't want to get there. <laughs> but but uh, I don't think we're going to get there in the near future. Uh, the the one really important number on this slide is the notice the EDA funding that's existing debt allotment uh, what we're seeing is that our wealth per student has gone to has reached a level that we're no longer eligible for any EDA funding so we're losing 1.7 million in EDA funding so that's coming right out of our debt service fund uh, I mean that was 1.7 million that was in there this year it's not going to be in there next year and we got to make it up uh, in closing, you know, I want to reiterate that CISD is in a great financial condition compared to most of our peer districts in the area. We have a low tax rate and a surplus that should carry us for another two or three years. Uh, however, as we just saw in the, with the EDA funding, there are serious flaws in the school finance system that need to be addressed. Specifically, the system does not provide for Inflationary cost increases are new facility funding for fast growth school districts, especially EDAs, which is kind of a subsidy to fast growth school districts. It's not doing the job that it needs to do there. We recently, as you recall, met with our state legislators to discuss these concerns, and we're hopeful that uh, they will be addressed in the 2009 legislative session. We don't know that they will, but we hope that uh, our message is being heard. So with that, I'll ask if there are any questions. Yes, sir, I have a couple. Um, so tell me, uh, our, our increase to the um, budget uh, surplus this year is $3 million? I said one to three million. One to three? Yeah. Right. And if if we project that, is there any reason to think that that projection is not the same? I I appreciate your conservative picture of things, but every time you quote us, for example, the assessed value, you know, at ten fifteen percent, ten point one five, it comes out at twelve to fourteen. And I, I understand. I I know the position you're in, Mr. Cox. But what I'm trying to get at is we've got a, additional revenue coming in each year. And I appreciate that you're conservative, but I, unlike you, have no faith, okay, in a resolution this year in, in school finance. None. Well, I didn't say I had faith. Okay, well, <laughs> well, well I, I, believe you said, well, I believe you said hope and uh, wishes yeah. and dreams and all that fit in the same category when it comes to that angle. But uh, frankly, and uh, I just, I, I want to know what you think we should do with the budget versus the tax rate because I also don't want to raise taxes I understand. and I want to keep the budget for not only the bond rating but for the health of our school district but there has to be the appropriate mix and obviously you presented us what you think but if if are there any other options well I, mean, I think and, and for, the for the moment, let's take teacher raises off the yeah. table. Well, I think the uh, the next obvious one to tap is the uh, is the fund balance, and 
you know, I that's why I put it on there. I personally, I think that uh, uh, we need to manage that surplus to last us at least three years. Three years is the number, really. It'd be hard to go beyond that. But uh, I would like to see us be able to subsidize in the range of uh, uh, fourteen million dollars, uh, uh, which would be a four million dollar drop in the subsidy. That's what I'd like to see. I think we can do that. I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think that would impact us. Uh, it would hold a good, strong fund, fund balance. wouldn't tap our fund balance much. And quite frankly, I don't think it would tap our fund balance at all because, I mean, uh, you know, in the end, we'll end up uh, having one to three million again next year, probably. We didn't pay Hopefully. for the bonus school we're there. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So anyway, I think we, I think we can, uh, I think we can keep, we can hold that reduction to four million. I feel pretty comfortable about that. And that's with the tax rate, where? The up, up, combined tax rate up how much? It'd be a three cent increase. Be two and it'd be well, it would all. It would be one, one in M and O and two in debt service. Right. I knew what you. Uh, I would point out that that would put us at forty nine cent reduction uh, over the last three years, which I would for the, I think you'll find I'd challenge you to find anybody else that'll be there. Uh, uh, very few are going to be in that position. Well, I think when we went through this presentation this morning, I made a comment that there's probably, let's see, assuming there's a thousand forty school district, there's probably a thousand thirty five school districts who would love this budget presentation. We're in a prime position. I think it sums it up well. We're right now trying to manage our surplus versus managing our yeah, deficit. Um, and to, to look at some of the numbers that Mr. Cox showed, to look at opening seven new facilities, knowing that the funding formula does not have cost of living increase, and when you look at what we're looking at adding, it's basically our, our, our raises. It's that same amount. Um, so it's a, it's a very good picture. You know, we appreciate you doing that, and, and I think it's a result of some very strong, um, a very strong belief in, in managing our money well. So it's it's a good position to be in. But I think you asked a good question. What, you know, how can we minimize that even more? But we may be in a position to do that with our fund balance. And um, but it's it's. I don't want anybody to lose sight. This is a great position we're in. And and I you know I appreciate any comments that anybody may have uh, if you'll mail them to me or and Dr. Stockton. Uh, like I said, we're still we're we're getting pretty comfortable with the budget, but it's still uh, it's definitely not in final form, and uh, uh, so uh, we're we're still looking at uh, at, at options, and uh, uh, would appreciate any feedback that you might have. Mr. Cox, we thank you and, and your entire department for all that you've done. This this district is in a very enviable Well, we're, we're very lucky, and I want to recognize uh, Darren Rice mm -hmm. and Janice Stowers and Teresa Carpenter over there from the uh, Finance Department. Teresa, she, she's not sure if she's in the Finance Department or not, but, <laughs> but, but we're, uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have them. And certainly Darren and Janice are the ones that uh, do the uh, they, we're very fortunate to have them guiding our not only our budgeting process but our uh, our daily accounting process. Okay, we will move to item six E, Mr. Rice. So moved. 
<laughs> Second. Very nice report you included. Great report. Very <laughs> nice report you included in our package, and I enjoyed perusing it. Thank you, sir. Is there anything you would like to tell us or share with us, Mr. You know, I really, in particular? Uh, you know, just just one thing that uh, Mr. Cox said that our fund balance does look like uh, with some strong ADA numbers coming in that it is going to increase a little bit more than y'all seen in our previous uh, forecast. So that's good news mm -hmm. for the district, and that's the main thing I wanted to point out. Thank you very much. No, we don't. Accept it. Okay. The next item on the agenda is uh, is closed session. A closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice for this meeting is authorized by Section 551.074 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed? Our executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be at either A, this public meeting upon the reconvening of this public meeting, or B, at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof, as the board shall determine. A closed session of the, door of the board will now be held. It is 7.25 p.m. I think it's 8.25. 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, Next item on the agenda is... Um, Human Resources, Dr. Stockton, Pledge of 9A. Okay, 9A is the naming of the York Junior High principal. I, uh, uh, as every time I come to the board with a recommendation for principal, I, I want you to realize it's, I think it's the most important thing that I do um, to recommend leaders of our campuses who in turn hire and work with our wonderful teachers. So I take it very seriously and, and I will tell you that I'm, I'm thrilled to make this recommendation. Um, I would like to recommend Jeff Fuller as a new principal at York Junior High School. So moved. So moved. So moved. Second. Eight. Motion is <laughs> made. It's seconded that we approve uh, Jeff Fuller as uh, principal at York Junior High School. All in favor, raise your hand. Those same sign. <laughs> 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 I don't know what to say. Dr. Stockton, you know, Ms. Snyder, the board, I, I was going to say I used to be about six feet tall about seven years ago when I started opening up schools with uh, Ken Sharples and uh, Kaufman and now York. I can say I'm very excited um, to go to, to York and take the assignment, and um, I look forward to it and adding a positive impact on, on York. I'm very excited, and I thank you for the opportunity. And I have my wife, and my kids are still hanging out in the background. <laughs> Back there, they had a lot of cake. <laughs> One was in gymnastics, and she had to go get him. I said, ah, it, it won't be that long. It won't be that long. <laughs> so she's about to kill me, but thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Very well. Thank you. Okay, the next item B, Dr. Stockton, I'll give you the privilege of naming the principal for DAEP, JJAEP, and JDC. It's uh, with equal excitement I make this recommendation. I won't go through my spiel about how important it is in my recommendations <laughs> for good principles. Um, the uh, uh, person I'm um, recommending to you I've known for probably 20 years, and I'm confident you'll do a great job in this role. And I'd like to recommend Ronnie Eichenberg for the position of principal for DAP, JJAP, and JDC. Second. Okay. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded that we name Ronnie Eichenberg as the principal of DAEP, JJAEP, and JDC. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. Congratulations.
Uh, Dr. Stockton, Board President Sasser, and the rest of the board members. I uh, had a long speech, but I will cut it real short. <laughs> I've been threatened with bodily harm, so I will keep it quiet. Thank you. I'm excited. I think it's going to be a great challenge, a lot of opportunities for success, and, and it, it's going to be a, uh, a lot of fun. I would introduce my wife, but she, too, is at a board meeting tonight. This is our anniversary, and this is typically how we celebrate our anniversary. <laughs> so, but I thank you. It's, a, it's going to be a lot of fun, and, and we're going to do a great job, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. I'm the Lone Ranger. Oh, oh I this is Alger. This is uh, yeah. JJP extraordinaire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Agenda item uh, 9C of the Human Resources Report. Do move, I hear a move? Move approval. Second. Motion has been made and seconded that we approve the Human Resources Report. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, no. Motion While we're cares. talking about human resources, I, I do want to uh, mention, too, that um, with the naming of Mr. Fuller <laughs> at York, uh, <laughs> you may want well, well stay and listen to this, but the name of Mr. Fuller at York, <laughs> Um, I am I am going to transfer J.J. Dahl, currently the principal of Hauser, uh, to take the principalship of Kaufman. Um, I'm going to uh, name Paula Green the interim principal at Hauser Elementary School, and next month I'll bring Paula back as the recommendation for the principal of Hauser. Good. Hey, man. Um. Item 10A, Community Community Justice Council. <laughs> it's easy for you, sir. Dr. Yeah. Uh, the Community Justice Council, uh, Mr. Tuff was the board representative for the Community Justice Council. And with Mr. Tuff uh, leaving the board, we have Madam President, I nominate Mel Brown. Second. Motion has been made and seconded that we name Mel Brown to the board. Uh, the Pardon me, Dr. To the Community Justice Council for Montgomery County Community Supervision and Corrections Department. Um, all in favor, raise your hand. <laughs> all opposed, no. <laughs> Motion carries. Okay. And finally, uh, item 10B, purchase of land. Uh, Mr. Cox, if you'll come forward and present the item uh, purchasing land, that, the land that we previously discussed. We have uh, two land contracts for tonight to consider. Uh, the first one is a uh, purchase of 16.16 acres for an elementary flex school from Wood Forest Development out in uh, West County off it's fish, on Fish Creek Thoroughfare or right off Fish Creek Thoroughfare uh, <clears throat> for 24000 per acre, a total of $387,840. Uh, it also includes an option for an additional 15-acre site within, if, it's, if we purchase it within four years uh, at the same price per acre. So that's a, I think it's a great deal. And I want to just say, uh, I want to comment that working with Wood Forest Development has been a, a, a very good experience. They, they've been great to work with, and they really are excited about us being in their community. Uh, <clears throat> so we're... I think it's a great opportunity and a, and a very fair deal, a really good deal for us. So moved. Second. Second. Question has been made and seconded that we accept the um, purchase of 16.1 acres in the forest development. Development. Okay. Any questions or comments? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, no. Motion carries. And the next one? Uh, the next one is a. Uh, contract for the purchase of four a uh, four acre site on 336 for 219,000 to complete our 186 acre site uh, mobility and drainage plan and provide a location for the CISD police headquarters right on loop 336 uh, recommend that we make this purchase so motion has been made and seconded uh, any questions or comments all in favor raise your hand all opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Do I hear? <laughs> Nobody's going to claim it. Yes, ma'am.